The Peter Schiff Show. Overnight, the price of gold rose to a six-year high. We almost got to 1440. I think the high I saw was maybe 1438, 39. It's up about 19 dollars at the high point, and then it became a very volatile session overnight into the wee hours of the morning. But I think by the time we got into the New York time zone, gold was still up about 10, 12, 13 dollars on the day. And it was up about that amount when the U.S. stock market opened for trading. Gold stocks initially had a small rally, but nothing big. And then they spent most of the day on the downside. And the uh, obviously the gold traders are still very cautious. As I've been saying, this gold breakout, even though we did see pretty big moves in gold stocks, I think the GDX, not counting today's losses because the GDX was down about 2% today, but not counting today, we were up 20% in the month of June. So still a very big rise, but really not nearly as big a rise as it should be considering, I think, the significance of this gold breakout, except, of course, if people don't believe it, if they're cautious about it, and so they're reluctant to bid up uh, the price of uh, gold stocks. The same thing with silver. In fact, silver never had much of a rally today, and it actually settled down, I think, $0.08 cents on the day, uh, even though gold ended up finishing up $4, well off the highs, but it didn't close negative. At one point during New York trading, the price of gold was negative on the day, but it managed to bounce back before the close. But silver, I think, ending at 15 spot 33, the gold-silver ratio that I spoke about on the last podcast, now I think close to 93 to 1. And again, I think investors are reluctant to buy up silver because they're expecting the price of gold to roll over. After all, over the last six years, Every rally has failed, and so I think people are gun-shy. Uh, they, Well, I've seen this movie before, and I know how it ends. Except I don't know if this is the same movie that everybody's been seeing for the last six years because the backdrop is completely different, right? Instead of a Fed committed to raising interest rates, we have a Fed committed to cutting them. Instead of a Fed committed to shrinking its balance sheet, we have a Fed talking about expanding the balance sheet by renewing asset purchase programs, uh, large-scale asset purchase programs, otherwise known as quantitative easing. So it is different this time, and I think gold investors still haven't figured that out. In fact, the catalyst for the reversal in the price of gold were some statements that came out from uh, the Fed, first by St. Louis Fed President James Bullard, and then later in the day by Fed Chairman Jerome Powell. But in fact, even before the market opened, or actually, no, after the market opened, it was 10 o'clock, we got some very weak economic data that really didn't have much of an impact at all on the price of gold, at least not immediately. But I did think that we rose a few bucks uh, after the data came out, maybe a slow reaction to it. But the numbers that came out that were weaker than expected were new home sales, for the month of May, they were looking for 680,000 in annualized uh, sales, and instead we got 626,000. That was a very weak number, much lower than what had been estimated. This is the second straight monthly drop in home sales. In fact, sales are now at the lowest level, new home sales, since December of 2018. So despite the drop in mortgage rates, Based on the Fed doing it about face in December, we've had a big reduction in mortgage rates, which make it easier for people to afford to buy new homes. But despite all of that support, we're still seeing sales of new homes all the way back to where they were in December of 2018 when the Fed raised interest rates and everybody thought they would keep doing it. We also got a much weaker than expected read on consumer confidence for June. In fact, they actually revised May's 134.1 number down a little bit to 131.3. And then we dropped in June all the way down to 121.5. I think that's the lowest number since uh, September 2017 uh, in consumer confidence. And of course, consumers still remain overconfident. Right? They're, they're too confident. It's false confidence. And I expect that number 
to continue to weaken uh, as we approach the 2020 election, which obviously is not good news uh, for Trump and is not good news for the country to the extent that it means that we elect a socialist president and a socialist Congress. But the price of gold pretty much ignored uh, the weaker economic data, as did the U.S. dollar. You know, the dollar index closed below 96 uh, for the first time in some time yesterday. And we actually made new lows earlier today. But then the dollar turned around and went positive at the same time gold sold off in reaction to the comments uh, from uh, the Fed. First up was James Bullard. And what he said that really spooked the markets, and you have to remember that Bullard is the, the dove, not that everybody is pretty much a dove, so it's, a, it's the degree of dovishness, and he is the most dovish. Uh, he is the lone dissenter, right? James Bullard is the guy that wanted to cut rates at the last meeting. He didn't want to wait till July. He wanted to already cut in June, and so he uh, was the lone dissenter. So everybody is thinking he's the biggest dove, and he came out and he said that he thought that a 50 basis point rate cut in July would not be appropriate. That what would be appropriate would be a, a insurance cut. And again, we keep hearing people talking about this insurance cut as if it's an insurance policy that we're taking out and we're going to pay the cost of the premium with a rate cut. But this is going to insure us so that we don't have a recession, which it's not going to work. I mean, it doesn't matter what the Fed does, 25 basis points, 50 basis points. They're not insuring against anything. We're going to have a recession regardless. But of course, the Fed wants to create a false sense of confidence that it can avert a recession by taking out this insurance policy. And it's not going to cause the Fed to have to spend a lot of its capital, right? It's just going to be a 25 basis point cut. So that's really what Powell said. Hey, we're going to get a 25 basis point cut. And, and maybe that's all we're going to get because we're just taking out insurance. Now, as soon as the markets heard that, uh, they sold off. I mean, the Dow was already down maybe 20 or 30 points and it quickly dropped another 100. And the price of gold sold off. It was up maybe eight or nine bucks, I think. And then it sold off negative on the back of those comments and the dollar rally. Now, obviously, you've got a bunch of drug addicts on, you know, in the market and they want more drugs and they, you know, it's a big habit and they need a big fix. And now all of a sudden their pusher uh, is coming out and saying, oh, you know, you guys were hoping for 50 basis points, right? This big dose of stimulus. And, you know, we're only going to give you 25 and the markets, you know, the markets fell. Now, maybe this was just a trial balloon, right, that Bullard launched on behalf of the Fed to kind of test the waters uh, to see how the market would react to the prospect of just a 25 basis point cut. And so far, it's not looking good. I mean, the Dow was down 179 points on the day, and that followed a relatively weak day yesterday. I mean, the Dow was up about eight points, but that kind of masked the weakness. Uh, the Dow transports were down one and a half percent. The I think Russell 2000 was down about 1.1 percent. So we had very weak uh, market beneath the, the fact that the Dow was up. But today we got the Dow down quite a bit. And then we had the S&P down almost a full percent. The Nasdaq today dropped one and a half percent. So the market's clearly not liking the fact that the Fed may not be delivering as much monetary stimulus as they had hoped. You know, Donald Trump has been particularly active on Twitter regarding the market. I mean, he's been sending out tweets, I think, all weekend, last week, this week, uh, reminding everybody about what a great June we're having, right? The stock market is having this great month of June. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. In fact, he sent out that tweet today. Thank you, Mr. President. It's pretty much a carbon copy of a tweet he sent out a couple of days ago. And since then, he's also sent out many, many tweets reminding everybody about how strong the stock market is and how we should thank the president for it, which, of course, the only reason that the stock market is rallying is because of the Fed. We should be thanking Mr. Fed chairman for the rally, uh, not Mr. President. Now, the only way that Donald Trump can claim credit for um, this rally is to the extent that the specter of tariffs, and not just the specter, the tariffs, has weakened the economy and cast a cloud of uncertainty out there that is providing the excuse 
for the Fed to cut rates. So if Trump wants to say, hey, because I wrecked the economy with tariffs and now we're headed to recession, because of that, the Fed had to cut rates and now the stock market is going up. If he wants to accept credit for that chain of events, but I don't think that's really something that you would want to accept responsibility for uh, if you're trying to claim that the stock market is going up because the economy is strong. No, the stock market is going up because the economy is weak. That's why the market is going up. The, the economy is so weak that the market expects the Fed to come to the rescue with cheap money. And in fact, leading the charge for cheap money is Donald Trump himself, right, who continues to criticize the Fed for not being easy enough, which infuriates me no end, uh, because when Donald Trump, again, was a candidate, and even long before he became a candidate, I mean, when he was a private citizen, go back and look, he was very critical of cheap money, of quantitative easing, of artificially low interest rates. I mean, that was part of his promise of making America great again, was let's move away from these phony uh, booms, uh, these big, fat, ugly bubbles that bust. Let's make America great again with sound money right, and real economic growth. Let's not hide behind these phony government numbers, right? these doctored up employment numbers that are frauds and cons. right? This is all phony. We've got phony numbers. We've got a phony recovery based on cheap money and government statistics. right? We're going to change all that. Well, he doesn't want to change any of that. He wants all that back. He's hiding behind the same phony statistics that he called out Obama on, and he wants the exact same monetary policy that caused him not to reappoint Janet Yellen, right? That was the reason to get somebody different, to not have those failed policies of the past. But that's exactly what Trump wants because now he's the president. So now uh, the phony economy benefits him, right? He wants the Fed to make him look good, just like they made Obama look good. But the reason he's president is because it didn't make the voters feel good. A lot of the voters realized that the recovery was phony and Trump's message resonated with them. And now he's in the White House. Well, if he's now accepting the phony recovery is real and trying to get the same voters to buy the same BS statistics that he called out uh, when they were happening under Obama, they're, they're not going to they're not going to make the same mistake twice. Not that voting for Trump over Clinton was a mistake. What was a mistake was believing that Trump would make a difference, that he would actually drain the swamp and make America great again. And so when the voters realize that that didn't happen, well, they're going to take a chance on something else. And unfortunately, the something else is going to be socialism. But let me get back to uh, what was going on with the Fed, because it wasn't just Bullard who was making these comments and launching the trial balloon, but it was uh, Jerome Powell himself. And he delivered a uh, a statement and they released his prepared remarks. And I think one of the, uh, the the comments that was made was basically that he was not going to be uh, bowing down to political pressure, that he wasn't going to do what's politically expedient, that he wants to do what's right for the country. Now, of course, what do you expect him to say? I mean, that's all he can say. I mean, there was nothing new there. There is no way that uh, Powell is going to say, you know, I'm going to do what the president wants, right? We're caving into political pressure. Uh, there's absolutely no way he was ever going to say that. So if the markets expected anything different, I mean, they're crazy. And in fact, nothing that Bullard said today is uh, bearish for gold. Nothing that they said is bullish for the dollar. They didn't say anything that we didn't already know. Basically, Bullard confirmed the fact that the Fed's going to cut rates uh, in July. I mean, basically, he said they're going to cut. He just said that he didn't think 50 basis points was appropriate. Well, he may change his mind by July when we get more bad economic data, but I guess maybe given what the data is now, he thinks it's just 25 basis points. But if the economy is already slowing, a 25 basis point rate cut isn't going to change that trajectory. So it's just a question of if we don't get 50 in July, we get 25. So we get another 25 or we get another 50 in September. It doesn't matter. Interest rates are going down. That's been confirmed. And the same thing by, um, by Jerome Powell. In fact, in the Q&A, right, he was specifically asked what the Federal Reserve was going to do in the next uh, recession. And basically, he said, well, we're going to cut interest rates and we're going to use all of the tools in our toolkit, including the tools that were developed during the financial crisis, like large scale asset purchases, otherwise known as quantitative easing. And again, everybody forgets, conveniently perhaps, 
that these tools were supposedly developed for a one-time use during an emergency. When they first developed these tools, they didn't say, hey, this is going to be our standard operating procedure. They said, these are, this is what we need because of this 100-year event, right? Something that hasn't happened like this since the Great Depression. This is totally out of left field. This is a major crisis, a major disaster. And only because it's such a bad disaster, such an unprecedented, you know, once in a lifetime thing, we're going to come up with these unconventional methods of dealing with it. But, you know, once the emergency is over, of course, we're going to reverse all this. We're going to shrink our balance sheet. We're going to normalize interest rates. And then we're never going to do this again. Right, we're going to put this aside, right, back behind glass because we really never should have used it in the first place. But it was only because it was an emergency that we took a chance on these unconventional policies because we really had we had no choice because things were so bad. Now all of a sudden, the Fed is saying, "Yeah, that is this is now what we're going to use at the first sign of trouble." Right, the minute if if we think we're going to go into a recession, even if it's not another financial crisis, well, we're just going to go right back to to quantitative easing. So this is what Powell said. Again, this should reinforce the view that you know we're going to have a quantitative easing as far as the eye can see, which is extremely bullish for gold. So what I saw in the market today uh, was simply uh, the market reacting. It's noise. You get maybe short-term overbought. We've had several days of gold prices moving up. We've had several days of the dollar moving up. Uh, down. So traders are looking for something uh, to take profits on, uh, some excuse. And I think that's what they found today uh, with uh, the Fed, Fed chairman and with uh, Jim Bullard. Uh, but again, nothing has changed. I think the breakout uh, is real. I think we continue to move higher from here in terms of gold and lower in terms of the dollar. But I think what's really going to kick gold into a higher gear and cause it to start moving up uh, in much even bigger increments than what we're seeing now uh, is going to be a real breakdown of the dollar uh, when uh, the world's really come to grip. I mean, right now, maybe there's some hope uh, that there's going to be some kind of big deal uh, at the G7 meeting, uh, maybe some kind of progress on trade relations with China. Uh, there's hope for that. Uh, the the odds of anything meaningful being accomplished are very slim. And so once we get beyond this event, there's really not much to look forward to. And I think um, the specter of more rate cuts and QE and weaker economic data is going to weigh heavy on the U.S. dollar, which means it will you know, cause uh, the gold market to take off because the, the strength of the dollar was like a weight holding down the price of gold. And as the dollar loses that strength, it allows the price of gold to rise. Now, also, you know, one of the things that, uh, that Powell said uh, in the Q&A was that it's important that the Fed maintain its independence, right? And that's why he's not going to pay any attention to uh, what President Trump is saying. And he said that an independent Fed has served America very well in the past. And it will continue to serve America well in the future, which, of course, is a lie for several reasons. First, the Fed may be independent, but it's independent in name only, right? Because the Fed acts very much as if it were an arm of the government. I mean, the goals of the Fed seem to be to try to perpetuate uh, the reelection of whichever party is in power. They're always trying to uh, keep uh, the economy expanding, or at least keep the GDP growing, even if what they're really doing is fueling a bubble, right? They're not concerned about the long-term economic health of the economy. Uh, they're concerned about creating the illusion of prosperity in the short run because it is p politically expedient. So the Fed is always political as it's pretending it's not. But of course, that pretense is an important part of, uh, of, of the Fed's job. It's, it, the markets have to believe that the Fed is independent. Because if they didn't believe the Fed was independent, they would be a lot more worried about the long-term value of the dollar, and they would be more reluctant to hold on to dollar-denominated assets, and that would mean higher inflation, that would mean higher interest rates. So that is, is something that the Fed is hoping to avoid. So what the Fed wants to do is convince the markets that it's independent, even though it's not independent at all. So what Powell is really trying to do 
is maintain that pretense, to maintain that illusion that we actually have an independent Fed, which I agree in principle, it would be good if we actually had one, but unfortunately we don't. But then to say that this so-called independent Fed has served America well in the past, no, it hasn't. The Fed has done a lot of damage to America ever since it started in 1913. I mean, the dollar right, has lost better than 95% of its purchasing power since we turned it over to the Fed. Before we had a Federal Reserve, when the dollar was defined as a weight of gold, the dollar maintained its purchasing power. In fact, I've mentioned on this podcast from 1800 to 1900, the value of the dollar doubled, right? The CPI was cut in half. It was at 100 in, in 1800 and it was at 50 in 1900. So before the Fed was managing the dollar, it doubled its value in a century. Well, in the century since the Fed has been managing the dollar, it's lost better than 95% of its value. So how has that served America well, right? The Fed has destroyed the vast majority of the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar. Also, the Fed has basically been a serial asset bubble blower. And all of these asset bubbles that the Fed has blown have not served America well. I mean, if you think the Fed served America well, then you have to think the financial crisis was a good thing because the Fed caused the financial crisis. And the crisis that's coming is gonna be even worse. In fact, Powell made the ridiculous point in the Q&A that the Fed did not wanna repeat the mistakes of the past, uh, meaning that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't as prepared enough. It didn't ease quickly enough, uh, you know, before the 08 crisis, right? So it didn't wanna repeat that mistake. That's not the mistake. The mistake was causing the OA crisis in the first place by being too easy after the dot-com bubble burst. That's the mistake that they're going to repeat. That's the mistake they don't recognize. It's ironic. The Fed thinks what they did wrong is that they weren't easy enough, that they didn't print enough money, that they didn't cut rates fast enough. What they did wrong was not allow the free market to set interest rates. What they did wrong was to facilitate uh, these asset bubbles and not allow the free market to correct the problems that were built up during the bubbles. Instead, they'd allow even bigger problems to take their place so that they can kick the can down the road. Well, you know, we're running out of room, right? We're running out of road and we can't kick that can. And the other way that the Federal Reserve has not served America well is by being the facilitator of the growth of U.S. government. The U.S. government is much bigger today than it would be if we were still on a gold standard, obviously, or if we really had an independent Fed uh, that was not facilitating uh, big deficit spending by monetizing debt, if the Fed allowed interest rates to rise as deficits rose, that would put the brakes on the deficit spending, right? Government would not be able to be spending as much money if the Fed wasn't making borrowing so cheap because so much of what the government is spending, it's borrowing. So we have a much bigger government and we have much more debt today thanks to the Federal Reserve, right? So this is not serving America well. And it's not just the government that has more debt. Consumers are loaded up with consumer debt. There's been a lot of debt that's financed, unproductive uh, stock buybacks and things like that. I mean, the whole nation is loaded up with debt thanks to the Fed. Right? So, you know, th there is nothing positive that the Federal Reserve has done. The only thing you could say is, it could have been worse, right? I suppose if the printing presses were turned over directly to the politicians, right? If the presidents or the Speaker of the House, if they were in charge, if they set monetary policy, then it probably would be even looser than it was. And of course, the markets have been fooled, right? If, the, if you turned over the printing presses directly to the politicians, well, then nobody would have any confidence. So by pretending that the presses are in the hands of these independent central bankers who are doing what's right, not what's politically expedient, you can engender more confidence in the fiat currency. And again, that's all it boils down to. What gives fiat currency value is confidence. Confidence that the central bank is gonna keep it scarce because theoretically there's no limit to how much they can print. So it's simply the integrity of the central bank to maintain the purchasing power of the currency that creates the confidence. And obviously you can instill more confidence if you can get people to believe that the, the steward of the value of the currency is an independent body that is not going to bow down to political pressure, except that's all wishful thinking because at the first sign of political pressure, 
they are going to be bowing. You know, and as long as I'm talking about, uh, you know, fiat currencies and confidence, I got to at least talk to about Bitcoin, which is a fiat uh, digital currency, cryptocurrency, which is also making new highs, right? And it's kind of, I think, outshining gold in that it's stealing the headlines. I mean, I think it's helping to obscure the gold rally because every time I hear them talking about gold on the news, they're also talking about Bitcoin as if the price of gold and the price of Bitcoin are rising for the same reason, which they're not. But that's what everybody wants to pretend. That's certainly what the Bitcoin pumpers want everybody to think, that Bitcoin is digital gold. And so both Bitcoin and gold are rising as safe havens, right? People are buying Bitcoin for the same reason they're buying gold, except Bitcoin is going up more because it's better than gold. And as I am recording this, I mean, the price of Bitcoin is above 11400 Who knows where it's going to be by the time again anybody listens to this. When I recorded my last podcast on Friday, we were knocking at the door at 10000 And it seemed obvious that by the time uh, the podcast was up and running, it would be above 10000 And sure enough, it was. And it not only went through 10000 it went through 11000 and I think, you know, a lot of people are getting caught up in this Bitcoin mania. And maybe some people that should be buying real gold are, you know, not paying attention to what's happening to real gold. And they are sidetracked by what's happening uh, with fool's gold. But there is a, again, misperception that these two assets are rising for the same reasons. They're not. Because if you look at, you know, stock prices went up initially. They're going down now. But stock prices rose. Bond prices rose. Gold prices rose, Bitcoin prices rose, but just because prices are going up doesn't mean they're going up for the same reason. I think that stock prices went up in general uh, because of speculation. People were speculating, oh, the Fed's going to be you know, printing money again, easy money, easy money is good for stocks, so speculators wanted to come in and buy stocks. I think people who are buying Bitcoin, they're also speculating, right? They're speculating that the price of Bitcoin is going to go up. Nobody is buying Bitcoin at 11400 as a safe haven. Bitcoin was at 3000 earlier in the year. Obviously, if it was at 3000 in the beginning of the year, it could return to 3000 before the end of the year. I mean, nothing that has that much downside risk can possibly be looked at as a safe haven, right? As a store of value. In fact, most people who are buying Bitcoin believe it's going to go to 100,000 or a million, who knows. Well, anything that has that type of upside potential. If you realistically believe that an asset can go up that much, you must also believe that it can fall dramatically, right? Because there's no free lunch, right? If you have the potential to go way up, then there's also the risk of going way down. Otherwise, it would be free money, right? There's no way that you can believe that there's no downside risk in Bitcoin, that it's all upside potential, right? Because then, you know, you can put everything you have into it and it's a sure thing. You're going to make money. It's not. It's not a sure thing. There is tremendous amount of risk. And if there's tremendous amount of risk, it's not a safe haven. It's not a store. The safe haven is gold. People are not buying gold in general because they expect it to go to 50000 or or 100000 I mean, people are buying gold now because they think it's broken out. And so maybe they think the support now is around 1350 or something like that or 1375 And they think it could go up to 1500 1600 I mean, people are not in general uh, pie in the sky when it comes to gold. And they're also looking for a safe haven if central banks are cutting rates and printing more money and there's going to be more inflation. It makes sense that people would be getting out of financial assets and buying gold. That's why bonds are rising. People are buying bonds because they think it's a safe haven. Now, personally, I think it's not as safe as people think. I think the risk is inflation, and I think that destroys the value of bonds. But a lot of people don't get that. They see recession coming. They think the Fed's going to be easing and they think it's going to have the same effect on the bond market next time as it had last time. So they are buying bonds as a safe haven. They're buying the Swiss franc, right? Buying the Japanese yen. These are the things that people are buying when they want less risk and they're trying to play it safe. Nobody is trying to remove risk by buying Bitcoin. Everybody is trying to get risk. Now, ironically, one of the speculations or maybe the main speculation that Bitcoin buyers are gambling on is that Bitcoin will eventually be digital gold. And that when it is digital gold in the future at some higher price, then it will be a safe haven because it will kind of find a permanently high price and then safe haven money will move into Bitcoin instead of gold. So right now, it's not that people are buying Bitcoin as a safe haven. They're buying it as a speculation that it will be a safe haven in the future, only at a much higher price. 
And all that is just pure nonsense. It's pure wishful thinking. It is never going to happen, but that does not stop people from betting that it's going to happen. And, you know, I've been getting a lot of coverage in the Bitcoin community. In fact, I didn't even realize how many online publications or websites they now have totally devoted uh, to crypto and Bitcoin. I mean, certainly the cult has expanded and they are jumping all over my every tweet. I mean, they're watching my tweets like I watch Trump's and they, they constantly want to make fun of me or point out that, oh, look how high Bitcoin is. So Peter's a fool, Peter's an idiot, you know, and stuff like that. And these uh, articles that keep want, wanting to bash me for not, you know, not liking Bitcoin or being negative on Bitcoin. Again, every single one of these articles brings up the fact that I, that I have a gold company, Shift Gold, and I'm trying to sell gold. Or they'll bring up my gold fund uh, that I manage. And they'll say, well, this is the only reason that Peter Schiff uh, hates on Bitcoin is because he sees it as competition to gold. And so he has to come out and trash Bitcoin uh, because, uh, you know, he's, he, he's biased, right? He's just got an ax to grind. And they don't want to consider for a minute that maybe I just don't believe it's going to work having nothing to do with the fact that I also happen to be in the gold business, right? That I just don't think it's going to work. They don't want to look at my arguments. They simply want to attack me and claim I'm biased. But the funniest part about it is some of these articles that are trashing me, they have no problem um, quoting uh, a, a lot of people that are, you know, fully, in, you know, immersed in Bitcoin, whether it's the Winklevoss twins, right, who, you know, are Bitcoin billionaires, right? I mean, obviously, they have a vested interest in the price of Bitcoin going up because they have so much of their net worth tied into Bitcoin. Clearly, they're biased, but none of these sites ever point out that or they'll quote people that manage crypto funds, right? who are saying all kinds of bullish things about how high the price of Bitcoin is going to go. And not once do they mention their bias because obviously they're loaded up on crypto. They need new buyers. See, that's the thing about Bitcoin. It'll only go up if you get new people to buy it. So once you own Bitcoin, you need to recruit more people. That's why it's like a cult, right? You need to grow uh, new buyers. You need higher prices, you need new buyers. And if you're going to sell, you need somebody to buy from you. So you're automatically biased once you're in, right? The only way that you make a return on Bitcoin is if the price goes up. And the price is only going to go up if more people come in and buy. So the minute you own it, and now you start talking about how high it's going to go, obviously all of those comments are self-serving because you need more people to buy. Yet they don't point this out. People who are running crypto businesses, they have an entire business is based on the price of Bitcoin going higher. And then when they come out and they make a forecast that it's going higher and these sites don't point out that conflict of interest, but they point it out when it comes to me as complete nonsense. Because first of all, nothing I say is going to impact the price of gold at all. Not one bit. But obviously what these guys are saying will impact the price of Bitcoin because number one, it'll convince the hodlers to hold on, right? Because when people start saying, hey, Bitcoin's at 11,000, it's a sure thing it's going to go to 20,000. And it's a sure thing once it goes to 20,000, it's going to 40 or 50,000. Those type of statements are meant to make sure that people don't sell, right? So that the people making those statements can sell because they don't want to compete with everybody else. So they have to talk about this, right? They have to get the price up. Now, I know I pointed out when, when I, I, I put a, uh, a tweet out there that it doesn't matter how high the price of Bitcoin goes because uh, in, if you don't sell, right? The, you know, because you have to sell, otherwise it's nothing. It's just on paper, right? And, cause, and, and then I said, eventually when all the hodlers want to get out, the, the bottom's going to drop out and all the paper gains will vanish before anybody has a chance to realize them. And a lot of people were saying, well, Peter, that's the same thing with any asset, right? No, it's not. It's not the same thing. Stocks pay dividends. You don't have to sell your stocks to make a return. You can collect your dividends. Bonds pay uh, interest. You know, you could clip your coupons. You don't need a buyer uh, to get a return on bonds. Real estate, you get rental income. You don't need the price of real estate to go up to make money on your real estate. You could just rent it out and get a return. Now, I know some people will say, well, Peter, not all stocks pay dividends. That's true, but they have earnings and they can use those earnings to buy back stock and drive the price higher. So they don't need new buyers. The company can buy back its own shares 
with its earnings that it generates by operating a business. But Bitcoin doesn't generate any earnings. It doesn't throw off any rent. It doesn't pay any interest. So it is not like any other asset in that respect. The only way that you can get a return on Bitcoin is if the price goes up. Now, people might say, well, that's the same thing with commodities, right? The price has to go up. No, because you can use a commodity, right? The return on a commodity is not simply the gain between the time you buy and the time you sell, but you could use it. You could, you know, you, you, it makes your life better. You can consume commodities and use them. It's not just about the price going up. Now, yes, if you buy gold, if you buy gold bullion and hold on to it, there is not going to be a gain unless the price goes up. But the price of gold will go up for organic reasons. There is always going to be demand for gold. I mean, first of all, in jewelry, you're always going to have gold jewelry. And the jewelry industry is going to need gold every year. So there's going to be natural buyers of gold, not for an investment, but to use the metal. And gold is going to be used in electronics and it's going to be used in aviation and aerospace and dentistry. And who knows what type of new uses gold for gold will be discovered you know, in the future. And there will always be a need. And of course, if I'm correct that we are going to be moving away from the dollar standard, that we're going to have a dollar crisis, I don't believe that the world is going to simply anoint a new reserve currency. I don't think we're just going to replace the dollar with the euro with all the problems they have there, we're not going to replace it with the Japanese yen. So what's going to replace dollar? Gold. Because the dollar replaced gold, but only because it promised to be as good as gold, only because it was redeemable in gold. So when the world goes off the dollar standard, it goes back on the gold standard. So a lot of the demand that I see coming for gold is not just for private ownership, but for central banks that are needing to, you know, replenish their reserves to give value to their currencies because right now what gives a currency value is the other currencies that are backing it up principally the u.s dollar but if the u.s dollar is no longer seen as a stable reserve because we're running the critting presses forever and we've got interest rates too low and we've got runaway inflation then what are governments going to back their currencies with to give them value and to create the confidence necessary for them to function as a store of value. And if they're not a store of value, they're not going to be a meat of exchange or a unit of account. So you have to back them up and it's going to be gold. So there's going to be real demand there. But none of this is going to happen for Bitcoin. No matter how much people want to pretend that central banks are going to have Bitcoin uh, in their reserves, they're not. So the only way the price of Bitcoin is going to go up is if more people buy it. But eventually, the people that own it, if they want to cash out any of these gains, if they want to actually get out of their parents' uh, basements and, and, and buy something uh, with their paper wealth, they've got to sell. But sell to who? Right? Because once all the people are on board, there's no one left to buy. Right? Once people believe that Bitcoin has topped out. Right? Because right now, yeah, a lot of people that own Bitcoin, they think you'd be crazy to sell. That's what the Wrinklevies were saying. They said, what's crazy isn't buying Bitcoin. They're saying what's crazy is not buying Bitcoin, right? That's what's crazy because it's going to go up so much that you'd be crazy not to buy some because it's going to go so high that if you don't have any, you're going to be broke, right? That's the, the FOMO, right? The fear of missing out, which is really another way for saying greed. Right now, people are too greedy to sell their Bitcoin, right? Because everybody thinks it's going to keep on going up. But at some point, people have to think it stopped going up. It can't go up forever, but... When enough people decide that it's not going up anymore, it's just going to go down because it stopped going up. Well, if everybody comes to that conclusion, then how can everybody sell? They can't. People can only sell as long as more people think it's going to keep going up. So it can never kind of reach a permanent level because the minute everybody agrees we've reached that level, well, now everybody wants out. Everybody wants to start buying stuff because there's no more upside. Now, of course, the Bitcoin people will tell me, oh, Peter, but by then Bitcoin will be money. Right. So we won't have to sell our Bitcoin. We'll just go into a store and, and buy it. That ain't going to happen. It is not going to be money. If you're speculating that Bitcoin is going to replace dollars and euros and yen and that prices are going to be denominated in, in Bitcoin so that if you go and buy a car with Bitcoin, the car is going to sell in Bitcoin and then the car dealership is going to take Bitcoin and pay his workers in Bitcoin, pay his rent in Bitcoin, pay his taxes in Bitcoin so that everybody is all Bitcoin all the time and no one ever has to sell. That is a pipe dream. 
That is not going to happen. It has to be sold, which means the bottom has to drop out of the market. The only question is when. And it's going to be when people least expect it, right? Right now, yeah, now I'm looking at the price. We're now through 11500 This is, I think, about the highest I've seen it uh, since this move. Uh, and so, you know, we continue to make higher highs. And every time there's a sell-off, we get new people buying in. But again, you know, I look at the, uh, the, the, the Google search trends. Uh, there is not a big increase in the number of new people uh, interested in Bitcoin, despite all the publicity, despite the huge increase in price. I mean, look at CNBC is, again is back touting Bitcoin as much as they were uh, back in the last bubble. Remember, I, I labeled that I said they should rename the, the network a uh, cable news Bitcoin because of the coverage. In fact, nonstop coverage um, of all positive coverage, by the way, no negative coverage. Keep on having people one after another on CNBC, totally biased, totally in Bitcoin businesses, loaded up with Bitcoin, touting uh, Bitcoin. Never a question that maybe, you know, there's a bias here. Maybe they they have an ulterior motive uh, to be so bullish. You know, of course, if I was on, I'm like, they don't invite me on. But if they had me on, like they used to, to talk about gold, and I said, well, gold's going to go up. Well, Peter, well, you're, you, know, you sell gold. You're just trying to get people to buy gold because you have a gold fund. They would never think about saying that to somebody who manages a Bitcoin fund, right? Who's his whole life is Bitcoin. They can come up there and say anything they want, any kind of pie in the sky uh, forecast. And there's never any, you know, a- any doubt, right? That they're completely sincere and genuine on all this nonsense. Remember, these are the same guys that were getting everybody buy at fifteen thousand, buy at twenty thousand when the, when the thing uh, crashed down to three thousand. So they've got the same old people making the same old forecasts, and you know they're just as credible now as they were then. Of course, these Bitcoin pumpers, what they're doing is they're trying to claim that this time it's different, that this rally that we're having now is different than the one that peaked out at at 20,000. And they're actually trying to put a positive spin on the lack of the significant increase in Google searches for Bitcoin, right? Because what they're trying to say is that this is actually better because it shows that it's not the public that is involved, but it's institutions. So that this is more substantial demand, that the rally that we had back at the end of 2017 was retail oriented, but now we have the big money coming in. Now we have the institutions. And, you know, there is a small uptick in searches. I mean, how could there not be given the coverage that we're getting now? There should be more interest. But of course, all the interest in Bitcoin is always centered on the price going up, right? It's never centered on the use case for Bitcoin because there really is none, right? So it's not that people want to utilize Bitcoin because it's better money, right? It, that it works for all the things it's supposed to do. What gets people interested in Bitcoin is the fact that they think they can make money, right? It's the price going up uh, that drives the interest, right? And of course, the price always ends up going down. And so then the interest goes away when the people get suckered in to the rally and they buy in and then the market drops. But if you look at the searches, even though they've gone up, I think it's about 10% of what it was. So people, there was 10 times the interest back at the last peak than there is right now. And again, I think, you know, this is the blow off of this second stage. I don't believe that this peak is going to reach the prior peak. I mean, everybody, again, thinks it's a sure thing that we're going to 20,000, which means that we're probably not going to go to 20,000. And people are going to be very disappointed uh, when we when we turn lower. But the way they're trying to put the positive spin is they're saying this is about institutions, right? Because this is big money, institutional money. I think they're pointing to some of the volume in the futures market as signs that the institutions are coming in. And I don't think that that's a very credible indication of institutional demand. I mean, maybe institutions are driving the price up to dump dump it. I mean, maybe they're going to come in selling these contracts. I have no idea who's behind the move in the futures contract. But as far as I can tell, there is no actual evidence of institutions moving in to Bitcoin. I mean, there is some evidence that they're moving into crypto like Libra with Facebook, which again, as I pointed out correctly, Libra is bad news for Bitcoin in the long run. And in fact, Bitcoin wasn't going to work anyway, but Libra will just highlight the fact that it's not going to work. So if people were going to speculate that Bitcoin would be the money of the internet and it would bank the unbanked in the emerging economies, that was never going to happen anyway. But once you see Libra and what they're going to do, well, then why would you believe 
that people would use Bitcoin when there is a better alternative that is actually available. But again, they're they're making a uh, lemonade out of lemons and they're trying to put a positive spin on everything so yes there is some institutions i mean they talk about i mean fidelity coming in i mean if anything all fidelity is trying to do is allow trading so that they can make money on trading but that's a lot you know easier said than done i mean i remember gold money uh tried to get into crypto simply so they can allow their customers to trade in crypto and they ended up having to get out of the business because it was too expensive that the money they were able to earn in fees for the trading wasn't enough to overcome the massive increase in regulatory compliance costs that they ended up having to deal with once the regulators knew that they were getting involved in crypto. So, you know, this is a lot of hype. There is no real evidence that there's this big wave of institutions moving into crypto. That is not what's driving this. Whatever's driving the rally, it's got nothing to do with new institutional money coming in. Because, you know, the institutions aren't that dumb. They're not going to be piling in uh, to the Bitcoin market. I mean, I mean, they may be making mistakes, right? But that mistake, they're not going to make, right? Not with other people's money. Because in most cases, the institutions are dealing with other people's money. And, you know, you're held to a higher standard there. You have to be a fiduciary. And people don't want to run the risk of piling into Bitcoin and having the bottom dropped out. And then they get sued. And in fact, speaking about getting sued, you know, I generally think it's, you know, buyer beware. I think a lot of people who are going to end up losing a lot of money in Bitcoin, I mean, it's their own greed that ultimately is, uh, you know, what the what's responsible. But this is America. And when you lose money, you sue. And when a lot of people lose a lot of money, you know, then you got a lot of lawsuits. And I think that's coming. And I actually think that there are some uh, accomplices here because there are uh, some Bitcoin pumpers that are out there that are being paid. Uh, either in hard dollars or soft dollars or some way they're being paid to pump Bitcoin. And there's a lot of people who are pumping Bitcoin as they're dumping their own supply. And I think when a lot of people lose money, in addition to the regulators coming, you know, and maybe there'll be some people that go to jail, there's going to be a lot of people looking to get their money back. And there's going to be a lot of lawyers, right? People are going to be lawyering up. This is America. And that's what happens, right? Even if it's your own fault, you fall victim for your own greed. You always look for somebody else to blame. And believe me, when it comes to crypto, there'll be plenty of blame to go around. But, you know, I want to finish up the podcast talking a little bit of politics. I know the uh, the Democrat debates are coming up uh, later this week. They, they split the field. So there's, I think, two debates uh, back to back. I think they're Wednesday and Thursday night. Wednesday night, I'm not going to be able to watch it live because I'm going to be in New York for the uh, U.S. premiere of the bubble movie. Uh, so, uh, and if you haven't, if you you can't, obviously not that many people can make it into the city for the premiere. I know the tickets sold out a long time ago, but you can order a copy of the movie on their website. I think it's letusdisagree.com and you can buy the, uh, the movie. Uh, so that's going to be the first night of the debates. I will be able to listen to the second night, the Thursday night coverage, I believe live. And I will probably on Friday, most likely do a podcast and I'll be able to go over some of the, uh, nonsense that we hear in the presidential debates as they trip all over each other trying to outbid each other on free stuff, you know, from reparations for slavery to free college. In fact, you know, one of the things that I wanted to talk about on this podcast is Bernie Sanders just launched his proposal for forgiving student loans. Because remember, Elizabeth Warren came out and she wanted to forgive student loans, but there were some kind of qualifications as to how much income you could make and to how much of the loan would be forgiven. But basically, Bernie Sanders wants to forget about all that, and he's going to wipe out all the student loans. I mean, no matter how much you owe, and no matter how much you make, your student loans are gone. They're completely forgiven, right? And obviously, it's going to be tax-free. They're not going to say you have to pay income taxes on all this debt that we forgave, right? So it's a huge windfall uh, for all of these uh, students who borrowed money. And of course, if you didn't borrow money to go to college, right, if you actually paid for college, well then, I mean, you were a complete sucker, right? Because you actually paid real money. You didn't go into debt. And, but now the people who borrow don't have to pay back the loan. So you were a chump. You paid for something that you didn't have to pay for. You could have done something else with your money. Or what about the guy who borrowed and then paid off his loan, right? He actually was responsible, paid off his loan. But now the people who didn't pay off anything, you know, get, you know, don't have to pay, right? So the the fact that they're even talking about this, right? Even if they don't do it, just talking about forgiving the student loans is terrible, terrible politics. This creates a tremendous moral hazard, 
right? It's, it's, and of course, the moral hazard is already there, but this makes it worse because if you create the idea that student loans are going to be forgiven, and if not now, eventually, right? If they don't do it this year, I mean, because as the problem gets bigger and bigger, the political pressure to, you know, forgive it is greater and greater, right? Right now, it's like 1.6 trillion. It'll be 2 trillion, it'll be 3 trillion, right? At some point, right, everybody is drowning in debt and all these people vote. And you get a big block of voters who are going to vote for any politician that promises relief, right? But when you start talking about it, the moral hazard is incredible because now people who wouldn't normally borrow are going to want to borrow. Hey, why should I pay for college? Let me borrow money because the loan might be forgiven, right? So why pay for it when I might get it for free? And the students are going to be tempted to borrow even more money than they might otherwise have borrowed if they think it's going to be forgiven. In fact, students will try to find ways to pad their student loans so they can buy more stuff, right? Clothing or furniture or whatever they can with their student loan money. Because if those loans are going to be forgiven, I want to owe as much money as possible. Therefore, I get the maximum benefit of the loan forgiveness. I mean, I'd rather have a $100,000 loan forgiven than a $10,000 loan forgiven. I mean, why waste that 90 grand? Let me go out and buy 90 grand worth of whatever I can and I end up getting it for free. But then of course the colleges know this, right? Once the colleges know that the students are thinking, hey, I don't even have to pay the loan back, right? Well then what difference does it make how big it is? Now it makes it even easier for colleges to raise tuition even faster uh, when the students know that they don't have to pay for it anyway. Hey, what do you care how much you have to borrow to pay for this tuition? You're not going to pay for it. They're going to forgive all the debt. Oh, that's right. Oh, I might as well borrow more so I can have nicer, uh, you know, uh, uh, housing or whatever they're borrowing the money for. So this is just going to take a moral hazard that the government already created and make it worse. And of course, this whole student debt problem was created by government. Before government, there was no student debt. Students didn't borrow money. I mean, nobody would be dumb enough to lend money to students. I mean, who's going to lend money to a student? He has no credit history. He has no assets. Uh, and they're kids, 18, 19, 20. What self-respecting bank is going to risk their depositors' money lending to a bunch of students that have no assets? I mean, of course they wouldn't do it. The only reason that colleges loaned to students was because the government's guaranteed the debt. The government said, hey, loan to this student because we'll pay you back if he can't. And now that's government guarantee. That's free money, right? That's like buying a government bond, except the interest rates were higher than government bonds. So the government created the problem. None of this student debt would exist but for government. And of course, once the government guaranteed the debt, now the students can come shopping for college degrees with all this government money. Well, the universities were free from any kind of competitive pressures to, to toe the line on costs and keep tuition down. And all the universities became bloated uh, and they kept raising prices with impunity because the students could always get the money from the government, right, to uh, pay whatever price that th they were charging. And so they created this whole problem. College is so expensive because of government. I mean, the government says, hey, you need these student loans because college is so expensive, but the only reason college is so expensive is because of the student loans. Before the government was in the business of making student loans or guaranteeing student loans, college was inexpensive. I mean, it wasn't so in inexpensive that if you were poor, you didn't have to have a summer job to work your way through. You did. But if your parents had a normal amount of money, they can cover the cost of college. But if they were kind of poor, like my grandparents, my dad had a summer job and that's all he needed. He waited tables over the summer, and that was enough to pay room and board for his entire year at UConn, right? So it was easy. Everybody worked their way through college or their parents paid. Now everybody borrows their way through college thanks to the government. So the government has created this problem, the Democrats in particular, and now the Democratic debates, they're all going to be talking about what do we do about this problem without ever admitting that the government caused the problem. And now the solution to the problem is to go all in on government, to get the government even more involved in education in the future than it has been in the past, which created the problem. The real solution to the problem, one that Democrats are incapable of seeing, is to get government out. Government getting in caused the problem. The only solution is to get government out. Get government out, stop the loans, no more guaranteed loans, no more government direct loans, that's it. And then college prices, tuition will plunge 
And then the only people who go who will go to college are the people who can actually afford to go and people who will actually benefit from the experience, right? The losers will be the bloated uh, educational establishment that's been feeding off the public trough on this, right? So colleges are going to have to get smaller. They're going to have to get lean and mean. And we're not going to waste so much of our scarce resources uh, on, on overpriced liberal arts degrees uh, that have no real value in the marketplace. And we're not going to have our kids wasting four or five, six years of their lives, right, at glorified summer camps, you know, <laughs> or, or, you know, it, this, it's all about the experience now. It's not about the education. It's about the college experience. Well, you know what? You can get this experience for a lot less money. We're broke as a society. We've run out of savings. We have to find ways of economizing, and we can't afford to blow all this money so that uh, teenagers can party for four or five years get drunk, chase girls, whatever they're doing. Maybe you can't even chase girls anymore. So I'm not really sure what the point of going is. If you're a guy, if you're not really going to get a valuable education, all you're doing is going into debt uh, for no reason. Uh, we got to put an end to this. But you're not going to hear any common sense talk coming out of these Democrats. It's just going to be more government solutions to government-created problems without ever acknowledging that the government is the source of the problems and that more government will only make those problems worse. Thank you.